Cone, the air with breaking news tonight, live pictures of the White House, where the president was supposed to be tonight. He changed his schedule last minute. You get to do that as the president of the United States and headed home to his home in Delaware after his son's conviction in that federal firearms case. This is the moment the president embraced his son following the guilty verdict. Hunter Biden was not made to go to jail after being convicted. Hunter met President Biden in Wilmington along with his wife and son. This morning, a jury found Hunter Biden guilty on all three counts, including making false statements while buying a gun and possession of a gun while he was addicted to drugs. He's due for sentencing in three months. Sufficing to say that these are the least serious and the least interesting of the charges against Hunter Biden. And it is fascinating to watch right now how both the Trump campaign and the Biden campaign are spinning these verdicts, the combined three guilty verdicts. News Nation spoke with a juror about the decision to convict. Perform the counterfeit out. When he checked, you know, to being addicted to crack or being an addict. That was, that was the biggest key factor. All right, there's a statement out, President Biden saying he accepts the outcome of the case. Remember, he has said he will not pardon his son. He has not said whether he will or will not commute his son's sentence if he does get jail time. And then President Biden added that he will always be there for Hunter. Remember, Joe Biden flew back from Paris in order to be there for the trial. And to be fair, the verdict was largely expected. It's not like the facts were really in question. He did an awful lot of cocaine and bought a gun while he was text messaging his drug dealer. But it's clear the White House is rocked. There was supposed to be a briefing today. It was canceled. President Biden was supposed to be at the White House tonight. He is not. And he was nearly an hour late to a planned speech about, and there is irony here, gun safety after the verdict came in. And to be fair, this is one of the very first gun crimes that Democrats don't care about and say is not a big deal. The irony of the president speaking about gun violence on the day of his son's conviction in a gun's case certainly can't go unnoticed. Just a moment, we're going to speak to London Roberts. She's the mother of Hunter's second youngest child, a daughter named Navy. She's going to tell us about what she calls a troubled relationship with Hunter. We'll also get into why the Biden family has turned their back on her and her daughter. But we start tonight with Shan Wu, former federal prosecutor who served in the Clinton administration as counsel to Attorney General Janet Reno. It's always good to see you, sir. Thank you. Um, let's put this in perspective because it was just, uh, what, a week and a half ago, time goes by so quickly now, um, of another unprecedented event, the conviction of a former president. So now we have a current president's son, former president, convicted of a crime. Can we compare and contrast at all sort of the seriousness levels of these two crimes that have now been uh, gotten jury verdicts? I actually think it's a little hard to um, compare them because they are very different kinds of crimes. Um, I think most importantly, neither of them are violent crimes, which I think is going to factor into the sentencing for both of them. And also one, of course, is for a public official, not just any public official, but the former president of the United States, and the other is for a private citizen who has never held public office. So that's the main uh, contrast I would see in them. Um, but I do think when it comes to sentencing for each of these defendants now convicted, uh, the biggest issue is going to be the lack of violence uh, and the lack of a prior criminal history. Okay, so if we just think about the, the sentencing comparisons, a Hunter Biden sentencing is expected 120 days from today, October 9th, so that would still be before the election. Although a firm date is not set, three felony counts up to 25 years in prison, fined $750,000. Donald Trump sentencing scheduled July 11th. An appeals court could delay the sentencing, faces up to 136 years in prison, $170,000 um, in fines. So you're saying, though, there's a chance that probably both of them won't go to jail. Yeah, um, one, a little bit of a in-the-weeds distinction, but the federal system uses a pretty complex matrix where they give scores for different things. So the judge gets a pretty firm recommendation of what the range is going to be. They're not bound by that, but it's a much more specified kind of recommendation with a lot of quantified 
factors. I just want to make sure I understand what you're uh, saying, which is that the the New York system, the judge gets to basically do whatever they want. And in the federal system, um, which is where Hunter Biden is, that the judge is much more constrained. Right. Right. That, that, that's exactly right. And I mean, they still have a pre-sentence recommendation from the probation officer, but it's not nearly uh, as specific and quantified as the federal system is. It's interesting. This is the special counsel um, talking today. And interesting, the prosecutor uh, in this case uh, from the Biden Justice Department, admittedly a special counsel, is, I don't want to say parroting, but certainly echoing the talking points from the Biden campaign and from Democrats, which is, Nobody is above the law, and President Biden isn't going to interfere. Take a listen. No one in this country is above the law. Everyone must be accountable for their actions, even this defendant. However, Hunter Biden should be no more accountable than any other citizen convicted of this same conduct. He seems like even the prosecutor is sort of arguing for leniency to Hunter. Uh, it does sound that way, and I think that's a reasonable position to take. Again, when you factor in the lack of violence, the lack of a criminal history, uh, that makes sense. I mean, I guess where I would quibble with him, is he's very specific as to conviction. I mean, as, as you know, I've taken a position that's questionable why they brought the case, because most similarly situated defendants, they don't get charged for this possessory crime or the false yeah, it, uh, certification unless it gets used for a crime somewhere else the gun. It seems kind of silly. I agree with you that it's one of these things that it, if if the, his name was not Hunter Biden, uh, if his name was not Biden, he would not be charged with this crime. And you and I may disagree um, that if Donald Trump's name was not Donald Trump, uh, he would not have been charged with the business records crime that didn't result um, in, in anything else. But the Hunter case sort of continues. Right. And you make a good point. This was the least interesting. And even uh, Donald Trump's campaign put out a statement saying uh, th- this is just a distraction. The real federal case that's going to be interesting comes in September, and that is the tax charges. Three felonies, six misdemeanors. He failed to pay $1.4 million in taxes um, September 5th. So right as we begin the race to November is when the Hunter Biden trial happens. Um, What's the chance that in the Hunter Biden trial, uh, the tax trial, we learn more about, if any, connections between Joe Biden or Joe Biden's brother to Hunter and his uh, work? Uh, It seems a little unlikely because it would have already uh, come out at this point. Uh, It'll be heavily litigated ahead of time exactly what kind of evidence is going to come in, precisely because that case is more complicated in terms of issues that could arise. That's the sort of situation where the prosecution will have to, ahead of time, vet with the judge what they want to bring in. And of course, the defense side is going to be fighting tooth and nail not to bring in anything but the most narrow focus on the tax crimes with their emphasis being that, hey, you know, he paid the taxes back already. And, you know, expect to see that trying to be pushed into the narrative, even if they can't make a case for selective prosecution. All right. Chen Wu, as always, thank you very much. We appreciate you starting us off Uh, this evening. We'll see you back in D.C. soon. The distinction of his son's conviction, the distraction that it's also providing, could be pivotal for President Biden. Remember, he's only got a couple of weeks now to prepare for the June 27th debate. New polling from 538 spells trouble for him. His approval rating fell to a new low of 37 percent. Founder of 538, Nate Silver, is now floating the idea that Biden should drop out of the race all together with us now, Kurt Bardella, Democratic strategist, News Nation contributor, Scott Trainer, head of data science for our partners at Decision Desk HQ. Uh, Scott always wins the best view. That happens every time we do this show and he's not in studio. Uh, Bardella, starting with you, are Democrats breathing, I don't want to say a sigh of relief, but at least thinking that this conviction kind of works in their favor? The world feels a little bit sorry for Hunter Biden on this, which they to be fair, should. Uh, Number two, now they get to say, hey, look, uh, nobody's above the law, and that includes Donald Trump, which we're hearing. But more importantly, number three, it's a no, it doesn't cost Democrats anything because nobody really cares that Hunter Biden bought a gun while he was addicted to crack. Yeah, we're seeing this kind of interesting role reversal today in reaction to the Hunter Biden uh, verdict here. We see a number of Democrats like 
ranking member of the House Oversight Committee, Jamie Raskin, make that point that you just made, which is, hey, the system worked. Look, Hunter Biden uh, you know, was tried and a jury found him guilty, and that's that. Meanwhile, we're seeing Republicans like Matt Gates, no ally of the Biden family in any way, saying, he shouldn't have been prosecuted for this. Uh, so uh, I think Republicans are recognizing that this kind of neutralizes on some level some of the points the Republicans were making after the Trump verdict. And Democrats are leaning very much into the Hunter Biden verdict as evidence that any effort to say that we have two different justice systems, one for Donald Trump, one for everyone else. Well, the proof is yeah. in the pudding. Today, the president's son was prosecuted by the Justice Department. Yeah, no, it's a great point um, in terms of where this goes um, from uh, this now to the polling. Um, Scott, Nate Silver saying it's time for the White House to put up or shut up. Someone who can't sit through the Super Bowl interview isn't someone the public can trust to have mental and physical stamina to handle the international crisis, terrorist attack, or other unforeseen threats. He will be in his mid-80s. That's Nate Silver all the way back um, in February. That sent shockwaves. And then there was today, uh, I'd make it yesterday, uh, actually when the program uh, began, President Biden was out at the Juneteenth celebrations. Uh, People were saying that he kind of froze. It looked like he was completely uh, unrecognizing of where he was at and the event he was at. Um, And then he spoke talking about the ghosts of yesterday. Take a listen. Let's be clear. They're all ghosts and new garments trying to take us back. Well, there are. Taking away your freedoms, making it harder for black people to vote. Do we see this sort of demonizing of Republicans by President Biden overcoming the, the fear of Trump, overcoming swing voters, fear of Joe Biden's, for lack of a better term, competency? It, it's certainly a strategy and they're certainly going for it, right? Look, in our own DDHQ, the Hill forecast, there's slight edge to uh, – to, to Donald Trump, um, and at least to win the presidency as well as win the swing states. Um, you know, you bring up Nate Silver's quote from February, which, you know, he, he has editorialized quite a bit in his Substack the last few months about, um, you know, Joe Biden being the incumbent should be doing better at this point. Um, but, you know, we're a few months out and Joe Biden's trying out some strategies. He's also got more money than Donald Trump does, um, which is going to mean a whole lot as we go through, you know, the campaign, campaign season in the next few months. But, but bottom line is this is, you know, but Biden is trying out different strategies and he needs some of it to get to get some traction in, in places like Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan and and uh, and nationwide so we can get the momentum back. Because right now the momentum is with Donald Trump. Yeah, and the momentum is with Donald Trump even after the conviction. Kurt, what do Democrats think is, and maybe we've already passed it, the point of no return with Joe Biden? We've started to see the New York Times out with stories about Joe Biden liking to tell tall tales. We've seen Politico, uh, also normally an ally of President Biden, come out talking about um, issues within his campaign, issues within his coalition. Uh, Is June 27th actually an inflection point for the debate? Uh, I think it is. I think that we have really, for the first time, uh, a situation where most of the American people, right or wrong, know how they feel about Joe Biden and Donald Trump. I think that what they're they're watching for some very different reasons. I think they're going to watch the debate to see, one, will Joe Biden's competency, for lack of a better term, hold up under the pressure of a debate. If he does, that kind of puts the Super Bowl interview comment that Nate Silver wrote about uh, back in February, that puts that to bed. Other people will be watching to see, can Donald Trump keep it together and not go off on unhinged delusional rants because that will send independents running in the other direction too. So that's what people are waiting to see. These debates in this way are uniquely actually important for once, not just political theory, but people are watching for core competency cues. All right, and I think that's a good point. The, the stakes could not be higher. Now we get deal with the expectations game, right, Scott? And the campaign, the Biden campaign, has said they're going to start putting him now back out on the trail more. They're trying to convince Democrats uh, that he's ready and that he's able and he's going to be able to, to go uh, the distance. When, when you do polling and you look at the voters, uh, how much is there to be gain or lost based on the can he do the job? Meaning if he has some terrible moment, uh, you know, he trips, he has some really d- disasterful debate performance. Um, does it really affect things? And if he does really well, if he exceeds expectations, 
does that suddenly you know, earn him a tranche in the swing states? So on, on instances like this, we call this, you know, campaign moving events, right? This is, both sides have expectations, um, specifically on Joe Biden's performance. And then he's got the audience. You know, he's going to get anywhere from 30 to 70 million viewers watching election night. This is a different type of debate earlier in the summer, so it might be on the low side. But even tens of millions of voters on the low end are going to watch this and they're going to come in saying, huh, I expect Joe Biden to perform like this. I expect Donald Trump to perform like X. And if they don't, if they exceed or go below, that could change their mind, right? Because voters aren't going to spend multiple hours thinking about this. They're going to have a few moments looking at a, a yeah. television ad, reading an article, or in this case, watching a debate. So, yeah, this debate has the opportunity to really move the polls simply because it's going to be a most watched event and people are coming in with some preconceived notions that could be proven or disproven. 16 days um, from today, you, both of you gentlemen will be with us. All right, Kurt, Scott, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Another huge problem for the Biden administration, and this continues to be one, getting a ceasefire in Gaza. Benjamin Netanyahu, prime minister, now says that he is a go for a ceasefire deal. So why haven't we actually heard from the Israeli prime minister himself? And the mother of Hunter Biden's five-year-old daughter says the little girl has never met her grandfather, the president of the United States. London Roberts' first TV interview following the Hunter Biden verdict when we come back. It's been almost two weeks since President Biden laid out his plan for a ceasefire in Gaza. It made it sound like it was going to happen in the next 24, 48 hours, and there's still nothing to report. But you'd be forgiven for thinking peace was at hand at the time. There's also reasons to think, based on what we hear, that peace should be right upon us. The U.N. Security Council voted to endorse the U.S. deal. Secretary of State Blinken promised Israel was on board. I met with Prime Minister Netanyahu last night, and he reaffirmed his commitment to uh, the proposal. So it's all come down to Hamas. This evening, the terror group said they were ready to positively reach a truce, whatever that means. But there's a lot of sort of words we need to parse here. Of course, Israel's made it clear they intend to keep fighting until Hamas is eliminated and the remaining hostages are brought home. Hamas seems to view their own Palestinian civilian casualties as leverage. What you're really seeing is another Middle East two-step, a dance where neither partner seems impressed with President Biden or his plan to end the war. Joining us now, White House columnist for our partners at the Hill, Niall Stanage. Uh, evidently, at least according to Barack Ravid, uh, Hamas just rejected the U.S. proposal as well, or Anwar uh, Sinwar, the leader of Hamas, did. We'll get to that in a minute. But just for the the last time you and I talked that President Biden laid out this grand plan and made it sound like, hey, a deal was imminent. 14 days later, there's not going to be a deal. Two weeks. It's going to be two weeks since the president of the United States said something was going to happen. It didn't happen. Does the U.S., does the, the White House, does President Biden risk making the United States, I don't want to say this, but irrelevant? Well, he certainly risks, I think, making the United States look impotent in a sense. Because, look, he said at that time two weeks ago, not only was there going to be a deal, but that it was a deal that could lead to the permanent cessation of hostilities. And he implied that that could happen while Hamas is still in existence in some kind of meaningful way. There is literally no evidence that Benjamin Netanyahu agrees with that, nor that the Israeli government or the uh, cabinet agrees with that. The uh, Biden administration keeps advancing this as an Israeli proposal, but Netanyahu has said there are gaps between what Biden says and what he believes. So there's a lot of lack of clarity, and I'm not sure it is constructive ambiguity. It just seems more of a debacle to me. So what is, if we think that these are smart people doing things that they view as in their perceived best interest, we know why Benjamin Netanyahu is doing what is in his perceived best interest, oftentimes politically motivated, not necessarily motivated uh, by what's best for his country. People can debate that. But from the White House side, why is President Biden seeming willing to risk so much, including the international standing of the United States, to appear like he's trying to get a deal? 
because he needs to appear that way, I think, for his own party, which, of course, is deeply split on this issue. There is just no question now, Leland, if you look at the polls, that the majority of Democratic voters sympathise more with the Palestinian side than with, with the Israeli side overall. We've seen the votes in Democratic primaries for the uncommitted line, which is effectively a protest vote against the president's policy. He needs to be seen to be doing something. So I think he's trying to sort of force these two sides together with great difficulty, uh, against their will to a degree, and certainly with extremely limited success so far. Wall Street Journal reporting Gaza's chief, uh, chief's brutal calculation, civilian bloodshed will help Hamas. Uh, Sinwar's correspondence, that's the leader of Hamas in Gaza, with compatriots and mediators show he is confident that Hamas can outlast Israel. In other words, make Israel continue the war so long that it becomes um, an international pariah. Point taken uh, that Benjamin Netanyahu has not said that he is willing to allow Hamas to stay um, in power. Hamas has not even come close to saying they're willing to have a ceasefire where they release Israeli hostages. Why should this continue to be on the Israelis? Well, Hamas, as I understand it, backed or expressed support for that United Nations Security Council resolution earlier this week which is, again, a complicated matter because it not only frames the supposed ceasefire proposal, it also goes into commitment to a two-state solution and things of that nature. Now, you said at the start that Barack Ravid is reporting that Hamas has rejected the ceasefire deal. That, as I understand it, comes from briefings from Israeli officials who, of course, have their own interest in putting the burden on Hamas if there's to be no deal here. What we're seeing is sides kind of indicating that they might be willing to have a deal, but bulking at the specifics. Well, that's fair. And to be fair, Hamas was the one who said they agreed to a deal that actually wasn't a deal in the past. But let's turn back domestically here. Um, There was a headline out of Chicago from the Chicago Tribune that the Chicago DNC of 2024 will not be a repeat of 1968, of the chaos Uh, in Chicago. I think what you're alluding to when you talk about the need by President Biden to get a deal is that if there is not a ceasefire, and maybe even if there is, the Chicago Tribune is right. 2024 will not be a repeat of 1968. It will be a lot worse for Democrats. Yes, 100%. I think you and I come at this broad issue from different perspectives, but I think we're in complete agreement that the Democratic National Convention could be potentially disastrous for the president unless there's a deal. The rage within the Democratic base... Hey, hold on, well, real quick, though, though Niall, and I'm going to let you get the, right, the, the last word here. Does a deal really matter to these protesters? They've now seen the power that they get. Um, We've now had people on subways and mass groups on subways taking over subway cars and and asking all Zionists to put their hands up while they're wearing keffiyehs. I mean, you've had real violence against against Jews. Is this really about the Palestinian cause or is this about the left wing of the Democratic Party looking to take over and the Palestinians are the vessel? No, I actually think it is the Palestinian cause. And we do have to point out, uh, Leland, there has been violence against uh, Palestinian Americans, Arab Americans and others, including those students who were shot up up in Vermont. No, no, you lose all credibility when you try to conflate a couple of incidents that were roundly condemned and every rabbi in America saying you shouldn't have violence against Muslims with the mass protests calling for the destruction of the state of Israel and genocide on Jews. You had me the up mass, until that point, but when we try, to create, pro- when we try to create a moral, moral equivalency here, it's just wrong. The mass protests, Leland, as we've talked about before, are primarily driven by opposition to an Israeli military assault that has killed 36,000 people about displaced 80% of the population and caused a humanitarian crisis. Around the fringes, do you get people who have more radical views? Of course you do, as in any protest. The broad emphasis is support for the Palestinian people who have been killed in very large numbers. Okay, so I, again, we'll give you the last 30 seconds. Then why are all of these groups that are supposedly only concerned about the Palestinians... Why are they chanting about the destruction of the state of Israel? Palestine will be free free from the river to the sea. 
We don't want 67 borders. We want 48, which means no Israel. Why are they, why are they harassing Jews and surrounding them and talking about another Holocaust? I mean, I am not defending anybody surrounding Jews or calling for another Holocaust. What well, I'm talking God. about is what is the propelling force behind the protest writ large? And it is understandable objection to a, an Israeli government that has now two leaders who are accused of being war criminals and a democratic administration's support for that government. Now, I think you make a great point, and where we'll end is that the, the administration has done themselves no favors throughout this whole thing. It's been... Um, I think, as you said, uh, the danger of becoming impotent, which is the worst thing that can happen um, to American President Niall. Thank you, as always. We appreciate it. Um, you're looking right now at the woman whose daughter is the president of the United States' granddaughter. But the little girl has never met Joe Biden or been held by her dad, for that matter, in a News Nation exclusive. Hunter Biden's former girlfriend and mother of his child reacts to the prison time that Hunter is looking at in her first post-conviction interview. We don't know if Hunter Biden's going to go to prison over his gun convictions. It seems highly unlikely. It also seems unfair if he did. But if he does, he'd have to say goodbye to his five children from three different women. The second youngest is five-year-old Navy Roberts, whose mom says he's never been held by her dad, Hunter. She also says Navy has never met her grandfather. That is the president of the United States. London Roberts writes about those missing relationships and about her own troubled relationship with Hunter Biden in her new book, Out of the Shadows, My Life Inside the Wild World of Hunter Biden. She joins us now uh, in her first interview since Hunter Biden's conviction. I think every day almost now, uh, certainly of the trial, we learned just how wild uh, the life with Hunter would have been um, or how wild his life was. You know, the Biden family really tried to crush you over and over and over again um, and ignored you and belittled you. And I'm wondering now if, Hunter's conviction and the public acknowledgement of how crazy his life really was and the things he did isn't somehow justice for you. Um, I, I wouldn't say justice for me. I'm, I'm not out there to get justice and, and tell my story as some sort of, you know, political warfare hit job. This is solely my story of emotions that I've had to process over over years and in hopes that I can help other people going through these same dark times. So what are your emotions now that he's been convicted? This is the, the father of your child is now a convicted felon. Well, you know, you have to respect the judicial, the judicial system and um, also respect that all individuals are held accountable regardless of who they are and where they come from. And, um, you know, but as as the mother of Hunter's child, my primary re my primary concern has always been the well being of her, and the future for her and his relationship. And um, it's my hope that the resolution of all these legal matters allow for them to continue that positive relationship. Okay. Um, Joe Biden flew back up to Delaware to be with Hunter today. I don't know if you saw that and embraced him. Uh, on the tarmac. And, and Joe Biden has made this huge point of, of being there for Hunter by Hunter and how important it is for him to be there for his son and on and on. Why do you think he never wanted to be there for his granddaughter? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I can't, I can't explain, you know, his behaviors and, and why they chose not to step in. I've uh, been advised by my attorneys that a lot of times grandparents don't step in until their child you know, steps in. And that's something new. That's something that, you know, my child and, and her father are building. They're building that bond. So you would think hopefully, well, you know, with at, time. But Yeah, we're looking right now at Hunter with one of his other children um, there at the tarmac uh, in Delaware right after uh, his conviction when the, the president came in. Uh, when you and Hunter were together, did he ever talk about his father as a parent? Was, did he describe his dad as a good parent, as overbearing as he was trying to make him proud how did how did how did we get from just a parenting perspective from somebody who seems to want to be there so much for his son and so little for his grandchild um he did hunter always wanted to make his dad proud that was that was a big thing he wanted to make um his 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 dad proud you know his his children proud it was it was something that he always wanted he never really talked about anything other than that I mean, you could tell by conversation that he just wanted to make him proud. 
but not in terms of what Joe Biden was like as a parent that would raise somebody who had these issues? Did he did Hunter worry that his behavior was disappointing his dad? How about that? Yes. Yes, he did. He worried about the, disappointing his entire family. Not Tell just me about his that. Dad, what did you say? Um, several times, you know, he would always talk about how he felt like he was a disappointment. And um, he hated that. He hated feeling like that and feeling like the black sheep and stuff. But this was during a dark time for Hunter when I knew him. And he was battling his addiction. And he, you know, he, he felt like he was a disappointment at that time. What would you say to him? try to encourage him you know like what can you say to someone who who feels like a disappointment and you see such potential in them such great potential you you try to encourage and 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 you would where where does the arc of and you make great point that you only want to be there for your daughter and you want the very best thing for your daughter is the very best thing for your daughter to have a relationship With her grandparents? Is that important to you that that sometimes happens? Well, as a mother, I feel like there's there's not enough people that can love your child. And if there are grandparents that can step in and play a positive role in your child's life, I don't see, you know, how that how that's a bad thing. Okay, Uh, I want to play for you a soundbite from the president's uh, spokeswoman about uh, you and your daughter. Take a listen. I wanted to ask about the trial going on in Arkansas with Hunter Biden and the child support. Are the president and first lady monitoring that? And how come they haven't acknowledged the seventh grandchild? I'm not going to speak to that from here. Why not? Go ahead. Have we sort of moved on from that in the sense, do you feel as though the Bidens, the president, has acknowledged your daughter in a way they should have? Um, He made a public statement. Um, you know, to acknowledge her, um, however, stepping into her life, he, you know, they've chose not to do that, which I've told you earlier, I've been advised by my attorney as to why that is. But um, I think from a PR stance, it's better, you know, to just avoid it. So it's a family matter and, and personal matter. I believe well, what are we, we going to give it an, um, an interview at some point. What are we going to learn about Hunter? What insights do you think are most important out of the book to help us understand this person, Hunter, who has become this odd figure in American politics, who I think you make a great point, is worth feeling sorry for in some ways, in a lot of ways is worth feeling sorry for. But to be fair, he's also done things that are really wrong. Hunter's, of course, as we all know, battled addiction, but he's battled dark times and dark places, dark tragedies throughout his life. And I think that, you know, you it learn. It sounds like you're defending him. I, I wouldn't, I'm not saying that. I'm saying uh, you would, what you would learn from the book is um, not this villain that the media portrays him to be. You know, you hear these charges and, and this is going on. He did this and he did that. But at the same time, you know, he cares about people. He tries to do good. Right. And if you build a personal relationship with him, you, you learn those things, those personal traits that you you get from actually, you know, from knowing someone. All right. Fair enough. Thank you. We appreciate it. Uh, we're glad to have you. And, uh, and good luck with the book. Thank All you so much. Tennis star Roger Federer shows everyone how to deliver a commencement address. Why can't everyone play tennis or give a commencement speech as well as he can? As you might have heard, grass is my favorite surface. <laughs> Big green, it must be destiny. And there's another reason I'm here, and I can sum it up in two words. Beer pong. (laughs) Or maybe subjected to a commencement address. And for most people, the addresses are extremely unmemorable. And they sit there and count the seconds until their diplomas are handed out and they can start the party. That's exactly what happened at my graduation. But there's a rare occasion when the speaker proves to be memorable, funny, even inspiring. Tennis star Roger Federer commencement's address at Dartmouth was one of those. Here's a few lessons from on and off the court. Effortless is a myth. Belief in yourself has to be earned. It's not about having a gift. It's about having grit. 
Discipline is also a talent. Trusting yourself is a talent. Embracing the process, loving the process is a talent. You can work harder than you thought possible and still lose. Life is bigger than the court. Former professional tennis player, former captain of the U.S. Davis Cup team, Patrick McEnroe, is with us. He also got the memo of Pink Tie Day. Uh, Patrick, who, who knew that Roger Federer, and I'm going to use this term judiciously, is such a role model? Well, uh, you know, I've watched him play tennis for many years, Leland, and he played with a lot of grace, but he's a gracious person. And, you know, I think it was a great coach, John Wooden, the UCLA college basketball coach, that said, move quickly, but never rush. And that's the way Roger Federer played tennis on the court. You know, we as tennis players, professional tennis players, even guys like me thought, God, it would be amazing to just be able to hit one shot like this guy, Roger Federer. But as Federer the person, I think is what impressed people so much, Leland, because he does have, he he is gracious. I've never seen him rush in talking to people. And I've been around him many, many times behind the scenes in front of the cameras. He looks every single person in the eye, and he he wants to know about you. It's not just about him. I've been around many great athletes, and it does become a lot about them and who they are, their ego. But Roger Federer, he just kind of walks around. I call it he saunters around, and that's the way he delivered this commencement address. He did it with style. He did it with panache. And even as he said, it it seems effortless, but he prepared quite well as he did to be an all-time tennis great. There's a lot to be said about that, and he made the speech seem effortless. Um, he talked about graduating tennis, which I thought was interesting. Take a listen. So I never went to college, but I did graduate recently. I graduated tennis. Graduates, I feel your pain. I know what it's like when people keep asking what your plan is for the rest of your life. <laughs> they ask me, now that you are not a professional tennis player, what do you do? I don't know, and it's okay not to know. <laughs> Look, it's a phenomenal line in so many ways. You think he wrote it himself? You know. You know, I think he probably had a little bit of help, Leland, but he delivered it extremely well. And you know, he's so. This guy- was him. The humility is real. The humility is a hundred percent real. And and this is a guy who used to do press conferences after his matches in four or five languages. So. He's very, very comfortable in front of people. He's very comfortable, obviously, in front of the mic. And, you know, when I first started in television, Leland, I was a sideline reporter from ESPN, and he had just won a big tournament. I went to interview him. The match went so quickly. And I said, Roger, is it okay if I ask you a few more questions? Because we got to fill time. You know about that, Leland. And he said, oh, no problem. And he looked at me, and he said, oh, you know, by the way, I ball boyed for you once. Just like that. I don't, he just won this huge title. I said, excuse me? He said, yeah, in Basel. He's from Basel, Switzerland. And one year, by some miracle, I made the championship match there. And he was a 13-year-old kid that was a ball boy. But that's just the way he is. He talks about, as I said earlier, to you as a person individually. Else, yeah. He doesn't make it about himself. That's why he's arguably one of the – he's obviously one of the greatest players ever to play the game. But he's by far the most loved player to ever play the game because of his personality and, of course, his greatness on the court. You know, Patrick, um, we put the link to the whole speech in War Notes. That's our newsletter every day, warnotes.com. Somehow this segment has made us like Roger Roger Federer even more, which I think is really cool um, that you were able to do that and bring him to life. Patrick, thank you very much. We appreciate it. We'll see you soon. Sounds good. Uh, Take a look at this, this video. President Biden, he looked really odd at the White House last night. So why are so many right-wing operatives still resorting to putting out edited videos to make Biden look bad? All right, take a look at this video. Joe Biden appears to freeze as he attempts to sit in an invisible chair at the commemoration ceremonies in Normandy. The freeze goes on and on, and the clip is edited so you never see him sit. The video went viral. Problem is, the video is called a cheap fake, edited to make Biden look worse than he actually is. And you can see the original video on the right and bottom of your screen. The Washington Post says the kind of selective editing is happening more and more. So there's kind of a question here, right? Like, there's enough ways that President Biden looks sort of odd on camera. Why do they need to do this? Why do Republicans do this? News Nation contributor and founding editor from Mediaite, Colby Hall, is with us. 
I guess we've been hearing about deep fakes and fakes and disinformation and misinformation, all this stuff. And this is the best they have, really? Uh, thanks for having me. But, uh, misleading edits is, is, does a real all disservice. All this time. To, well, I mean, you don't need to do, I mean, honestly, if you, anyone that watches Biden stiffen and slow, it, it's tough. Yeah, I mean, he's, a, he's an elderly 81-year-old grandfather who may be good-hearted, but he clearly struggles to keep up the pace that he had even three years ago. I mean, you're watching this footage of him at the Juneteenth ceremony at the White House, and he was stiff. He was smiling. Perhaps he was tired. Who knows? But then to sort of, like, edit it in such a way to make him look worse only opens up a conversation for his defenders to reasonably say that, you know, it's deceptive, it's misleading, and it right. takes away from the real issue that he's very old. All right, there, there's a dot, dot, dot to this, right? We're, we're always warned, deep fakes are coming, misinformation, disinformation, disinformation, misinformation, on and on. Uh, today, the, the son of the President of the United States was convicted of a crime. He was largely convicted uh, based on evidence found on his laptop that we were told before the former election was disinformation, misinformation from the Russians, and 50 uh, members of the intelligence community signed up to this, and on and on and on. Are you hearing, because you talked to all members of the media, that they're worried about their own credibility when they start calling things dis and misinformation if they, in the past, so flagrantly put their thumb on the scale? It's a great question. And frankly, um, you know, I think we're evolving to, to the degree that like where everything is subjective and emotionally and psychologically feeling based, what is misinformation? I mean, it goes back to Kellyanne Conway saying alternate facts, alternative facts, we, which she was derided for. But, but, but she was onto something. Because when we talk about people on the left, like saying, respect my truth, it suggests that there's multiple truths out there or multiple sets of facts. And one man's disinformation or misinformation is another person's, you know, opinion. And, yeah, and, hold on. I, I, this is for a yeah. longer time, but Hunter Biden's laptop was real. That is not disinformation. There, there is no facts. It was admitted in court. It, like, yeah, the, well, there's the a book. There's a book. And I'm going to send you a book for your bookcase, Okay. <laughs> Nothing's true, but everything's possible. It's about Russia. You're going to love it. Uh, unfortunately, Colby, we got we to gotta run. Very good stuff from you uh, as well. Thanks for joining us. A lot more tomorrow. Warnotes.com for our daily newsletter. Here's Chris.